So uh, we're in really good shape, and I'll uh, uh, run through some data first. Um, uh, so as of uh, yesterday evening, um, unfortunately, we had about 825,000 cases in the United States. New Hampshire active cases were 1,490. Vermont active cases were 818. Both those numbers are probably going to be a little higher today. Uh, there have been 45,000 deaths in the, in the U.S., and in New Hampshire, 42, in Vermont, 40. Uh, again, with the majority of those cases coming from uh, patients that resided in nursing homes, long-term care facilities, and assisted living facilities uh, in Chittenden County, um, which is not surprising. That's where all the people are, and the same uh, New Hampshire is in the same boat. Southern New Hampshire and the seacoast of New Hampshire, where the majority of the population is, they've seen the most cases and the most uh, deaths. Um, up until very recently at Mount Scutney Hospital, we only had uh, generally about one patient per week on our inpatient or in our rehab unit that had um, uh, COVID-19. When I say that in our rehab unit, uh, we are actually cohorting all of our COVID-19 patients uh, whether they be post-acute rehab patients or acute patients coming through the ED or transfers from Dartmouth Hitchcock, we are cohorting them all on uh, all on one unit where we have set up ten uh, uh, rooms uh, with negative pressure capability for pretty much the entire uh, unit. Uh, that way, we also cohort our uh, care providers and nursing staff as well. Um, we are, Mount Scutney Hospital is the, um, really the post-acute uh, resource for Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, and that, is, that includes um, uh, COVID patients. So we are now seeing an, an uptick in patients that have recovered from their acute illness at Dartmouth Hitchcock, but need more post-acute time and rehab before getting home. Um, so I, I expect that we'll have uh, five or six COVID-positive patients uh, getting rehab services with us um, by, the, by the end of the week. Um, I think in the big picture, um, Vermont is most likely past any peak or surge of patients that we were going to see. Social distancing was incredibly effective. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we're, we're basically prolonging um, uh, the, the time with which COVID-19 is circulating in the community. That's that's part and parcel of flattening the curve um, uh, uh, to, to lower infections and to kind of prevent uh, an onslaught of patients to our hospitals and overwhelming our, our resources. Um, but um, again, due to the social distancing, we think we are past that. I believe that what we are going to see is sequences of or repetitive kind of micro surges moving through the summer and fall where as we open up the economy and people start circling, uh, we're going to see um, uh, more cases of COVID and there'll be more cases diagnosed. Unfortunately, there'll be more deaths, but that's going to be the cost of, of reopening our economies. And, and I'm not clamoring to stay in lockdown. Um, we are prepared for any surge of patients that we get, um, but we all have to go in with our eyes open that as we as we open up our economies, um, there are going to be more cases. Um, along those lines, um, we are uh, uh, now planning to reopen significant medical and surgical services at Mount Scutney. There's been a lot of folks who have put off care, whether that be surgical care, cataract surgery, uh, procedures for patients with chronic pain, um, and what we've done in the last four to six weeks is build up uh, our infrastructure so that we can provide uh, really parallel lines of, of care, especially on our inpatient side, with our ability to cohort COVID-positive patients on one end of the hospital and on the outpatient side, cohorting all of our all patients with respiratory complaints or. Uh, uh, high-risk COVID travel histories or exposures, um, we feel confident that we can basically open up most of the rest of the hospital and our clinics to provide care uh, for everyone else, whether that be routine primary care, uh, preventative and diagnostic care, 
Um, so we are uh, putting together our plans over the next uh, week and a half so that the week of May 4th we'll uh, be able to offer more uh, to our patients. As I said, uh, we're confident that we can do this safely. Our primary concern is the safety of our staff uh, and of our patients. Um, but we feel we're in a really good spot. A lot of planning and preparation over the last six weeks um, so that moving forward, uh, in the phrase I use all the time at work now, is this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and we're going to be dealing with this until we have uh, dealing with COVID-19 until we have either herd immunity, which means enough folks have been exposed um, that it becomes like another, uh, you know, uh, cold virus, another coronavirus that can cause some rough respiratory symptoms, but not the amount of uh, morbidity and mortality that we're seeing. Or we have an effective vaccine, um, and that's still that's still a year away. So we have to be prepared as healthcare providers to um, to provide care for folks that have COVID and all the other folks that don't, um, but that still need ongoing care. We've made uh, significant investments in our telehealth options. So, and that's more than just talking to your doc on the phone. Uh, we uh, uh, now have um, uh, embedded video telehealth um, uh, resources in our electronic medical records. Uh, what we found is that the, the biggest impediment to that is actually the patients on the other side who may not have a smartphone or a tablet um, or uh, adequate enough broadband service so that we can actually have the, 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 the video visit. Um, but we're making progress there. And uh, as I said, we're, we're going to be Really starting the message in the community for our patients that, that, that uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to have them back, that we can, again, safely care for them, keep our staff safe, and be able to provide care for the COVID and non, non-COVID population. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with how I started. I think we're in really good shape. Um, and uh, we're, but we're still going to learn as, as we move through this, that we move into the recovery phase. Um, uh, of this illness, and when I say recovery, it's really operationally and, and, and financially as well. Um, well. Hospitals are not alone in feeling the, the economic catastrophe that this has been for, uh, uh, for, for all small businesses uh, and for our employees. Uh, we've been in a very good spot in the sense that we have not had to furlough or lay off any of our folks, and that has been stark contrast to pretty much every other um, hospital outside uh, of Dartmouth, so, and all of, and all, every hospital in Vermont. So um, I'm happy we've been able to do that, uh, but moving forward, it's still going to be a financial minefield uh, for all of us. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and see if uh, anyone on the line has any questions about um, COVID-19 epidemiologically or what we're trying to do at the hospital. Uh, Joe, this is Tom Marsh. Hi, Tom. Um, hey, are you, um, as the policy is being set for what opening up is going to look like, the, um, are you confident that the healthcare community has got a big voice in what's going to be happening um, since well, nobody really knows what after May 15th yeah. looks like? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, Tom. Um, I would say uh, Governor Scott has has surrounded himself with expert uh, medical and, and business. Uh, Mark Levine, who is the Commissioner of Public Health, is a great resource. Um, I'm on um, the Emergency Preparedness Statewide Task Force, uh, working within the Department of Health, uh, as well as uh, in coordinating closely with the uh, AHS and, uh, and others. The Hospital Association, uh, which we're a part of, uh, also has a strong voice uh, at the table. Uh, so I, I think that the, the governor has, been, has really made, frankly, all the right decisions uh, thus far. Now, opening up is a much harder decision than closing down. I think closing everything down was actually easier because there really was no other choice. Um, I, I'm hoping it's not, you know, tattoo parlors and hair salons um, uh, that we that we jump to. Uh, unlike Georgia, I don't think we, we would ever do that. But I, I do think that 
um, medical leaders have a have a have a pretty strong voice. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think actually hospitals, if left to their if, if left on their own, would probably get too far ahead of things um, because we're seeing the uh, heads up demand um, and evidence that. Uh, folks aren't getting the care that they need right now because they're frankly terrified from coming into the hospital um, or to our clinics. Um, and, 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 and that's really because we were really, uh, we were quite strong with our messaging to stay away because we, we, that was what we had to do at the time. Um, but, you know, now we have to walk that back a little bit and say, look, these are the structures that we have in place to keep patients and staff safe and uh, unexposed to uh, to COVID, um, keeping in mind that this is circulating in the community and folks can be asymptomatic, entirely asymptomatic, but infectious to others for, you know, up to three or four days in some cases. So we're going to do our best, and we've actually done a remarkable job in our respiratory clinic of keeping positive cases of COVID out of the hospital and out of the rest of our clinic space. Um, but, you know, as it increases its prevalence in the community, we're going to we're, we're going to see we're going to see um, uh, more and more cases that that get by all the surveillance and all the monitoring and screening that we have in place for all of our visitors, patients, and staff, um, because that's just going to be the nature of the virus. When when enough of us have it, um, we'll stop worrying about it. I guess. Any other uh, thoughts, uh, concerns, anything I can help answer at least kind of medically where we're headed? Like it's not as bad as it could have been. Yeah, no, uh, I would say the, the, you know, the state of Vermont ha has shared worst case, best case, and most likely case scenarios uh, throughout this, and we are tracking on the best case scenario right now. Um, but again, that's because, uh, you know, uh, Vermonters, northern New England folks, uh, we social distance really well. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of in our genes, so that's why we're um, here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but we do, at the same time, I, you know, you have to balance that with we've got to we've got to open up um, and uh, get back to work, and that's hospitals, small businesses. Uh, we got to do it safely, um, but this is a unsustainable um, a model for the entire country. Vermonters are not immune to that. Are you seeing anything? Um that's resulting from Vermont and New Hampshire not having identical policies on what you can and can't do. We're running into some of that with, say, construction projects where, depending on where the crew is from, uh, right now yeah. Vermont's uh, more strict on what, what cannot be done in that particular arena. But are you seeing that with facilities on both sides of the river? Yeah, not really. I would say the, the, the clinical experience for hospitals on both sides of the river, uh, at least up here, have been the same. There are uh, very few inpatients, uh, very few ICU patients at Dartmouth Hitchcock, um, and and that's seeing that at Valley, down at Springfield, um, uh, pretty much everything north of of Manchester uh, looks the same uh, right now. So I, I think everyone's hope is that New Hampshire and Vermont get on the same page, and we are we are trying to um, uh, do that both for how we open up our hospital services on both sides of the river um, as well. It's not good for Vermont hospitals if all the New Hampshire ones throw the throw the gate open wide and start doing uh, a ton of work and procedures. Um, we should be trying to do this together, since you know many of us in the Upper Valley work closely with our partners across the river. Um, but we haven't seen it clinically. Um, my, my hope is that Governor Scott, um, especially on the construction side and other non-essential services, uh, I'm hoping that he and Governor Sununu can work uh, work, work uh, closer together on that. Um, on the town side, not much has changed from what we're doing since our last call. Uh, the one slight change is our uh, town clerk office is uh, once again accepting in-person appointments. We schedule one to two a day and go through a, a number of protocols on having a person come in, how they interact with our staff, what they can do once they're in the building. But 
Uh, that, that is a very recent development. But other than that, all the offices are open. They're just not open to the public, so we're doing a lot of electronic uh, business back and forth. Um, really where our focus is these days is what the financial picture is going to look like in the months ahead that depending on what reopening looks like, uh, people are going to be can be in vastly different positions on, on their abilities to uh, meet their uh, tax and utility bill obligations, and we don't have much in the way of latitude for changing what those requirements are. And then aside from being able to, say, delay a collection date, uh, if the money isn't coming in, uh, most of our expenses uh, stay in place. Our fire police and uh, highway crews are all still working. Um, so we're watching very closely uh, what may be available to municipalities to fund the gaps that will result from uh, this lack of revenue. And that's the tax revenue is different than uh, many towns that rely on a variety of revenue streams, uh, local option, hotel and meal taxes, uh, parking meters, things like that, which have just dried up to nothing. So they're seeing a, a more immediate impact on what their revenues are, and those are, those are funds that they're never going to recoup. We have um, a fairly significant revenue stream from our ambulance transport service, so, Joe, if you would like to schedule rides, um, that would help our financial position. We'll be glad to charge you guys for those. But um, right now we haven't seen a huge dip, but our, our, our revenues are off on that. So, uh, so the financial picture is uncertain, and then the services picture. I've spoken a bit about what we're doing in our, our recreation departments. Um, we're prepared for everything from no social gathering to intermediate to hopefully, you know, at some point getting back to normal. But we have contingencies in place under all of those scenarios. Right now, we don't have any anticipation of holding uh, large gatherings, uh, concerts on the common right now. Uh, our little leagues aren't going to take place. So, but we're looking on how can we backfill that in? Can we have three-on-three -three tournaments if, uh, if we can't have a little league, stuff like that? So we've been spending a lot of time thinking about what, what is the, the social experience is going to be in Windsor over the summer and into the fall. Um, hopefully, as the weeks go by, we'll get a, a more clear picture on what that's going to look like. But um, we certainly... From our emergency uh, services, we're prepared for uh, worse than we've received. Uh, they still are taking all the precautions that are necessary when they're going on call, but we're thankful that um, everybody has adhered to the uh, stay-at-home policies and we've seen the results that we have. So that's about it from my end. Hey, Tom, this is uh, Dave from the school, uh, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this call talking about this, but have you, are you thinking about adjusting the property tax payment dates, or, or I know a couple of towns have done that already, uh, and there's gonna be some discussions at higher levels than you and I sit at around who's ultimately responsible for you know, because obviously our our operation depends heavily, two-thirds of our operation depends on those property taxes, needless to say. Um, what Have you given that any thought, uh, or have you thought about what's going to happen if you really end up really short, people can't pay their property taxes? I mean, or, or is, it, is it still too early to decide how that's going to go? Uh, well, it's, we are getting it thought, but it's... Uh the, the, the variables can be so wide. On the one side, our, our final tax bill was due on April 13th, and right now we are in essentially the same position we are every year at this time with our delinquencies. I think we're at about 5%, which is typical. So up till now, our, coll our collections have been as, as they have been in the past, but we, we aren't able at this point to go forward with uh, the tax sale process, so collecting those delinquencies is 
certainly going to be a challenge, and we're going to be behind the eight ball by a couple hundred thousand on that. When it goes towards uh, the next fiscal year, starting July 1st, and what that collection looks like, there, it's kind of like there's a rule and a workaround. The rule is municipalities do not have the authority to change tax collection dates. So I think our first installments do something around September 8th or 9th. From a workaround perspective, another legislative directive is that residents must be given 30 days notice that their taxes are due. So we could not change the date, but if we delayed mailing out the bill, let's say we delayed mailing out the bill for two months, we have to give them 30 days notice, so that would, in effect, delay the collection two months. But thinking about doing that is we are pretty thin on reserve funds. So we can get through a couple of months so we'll cash in the bank, but if the state or feds aren't coming up with a way to fund a gap, uh, it would be very difficult for us to offer a blanket uh, delay because certainly fewer people are going to pay if they're given an option not to pay than if we do. And if, and if our revenues drop significantly, uh, we would be in a position where we wouldn't be solvent. So we're really holding on to see what kind of programs may be out there to assist municipalities in that regard. Yeah, well, hopefully there will be, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, there's certainly going to be thousands of bigger problems in the Windsor when it comes to that, so somebody's got to be thinking yeah. about it. And it'll be everywhere, too. It won't just be here. The only other question I have to you, Tom, is, so right now you don't, you, you're, you're, <clears throat> you're sort of, holding off on decisions around summer recreation programs? Uh, or were you talking about the immediate spring stuff? Are, have you not gotten to the summer decisions yet? No, we're, we're, it's, it's, in the beginning we were thinking that our summer programs could just be starting earlier with the school's earlier uh, recess, knowing that the kids are still supposed to be at home learning, but there's probably going to be greater demand for other activities. Um, I'm quite sure at this point we have canceled a little league for the whole summer um, and our summer camp programs while we are still pursuing our normal staffing and programming we are also making provisions for uh, examples like if our if our town beach isn't open what can we do about that or let's say we can limit the number of people on the town beach to 20 and we have a camp program that says Tuesday is beach day for this group of kids, and it's hiking in the woods for that, like so that we can break the kids into smaller groups, keep them all separate, and let them stay on activities. But uh, one way or the other, well, we already know from the calls that we get that there's great demand by parents to offer programming to their children. We're, and we'll be prepared, but it's all going to be dependent on, on how many people can gather. And we're also looking at drop-off and pick-up locations because you can't have a bunch of small groups, but everybody get dropped off at the same door in the morning. So uh, it's frustrating not knowing, but we're, we're working through programs for the whole summer. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. Uh, and that's a good segue into the schools. Did anybody else have a question for Tom before I tell you what, what a little bit that's going on with school right now? Okay, that's good. Then we'll just segue into the schools, and um, <clears throat> uh, you know, you, you, you can you, you can almost guess that uh, from what we're getting from both the governor's office and the, and the uh, agency of education, that as we begin to uh, uh, s s soften some of these uh, restrictions, that my guess is, you know, schools will be some of the last places that. Uh, that uh, because if anybody has been in a school recently, you know that it's uh, it's it's packed with little runny-nosed kids, and uh, you know when the bell rings, the corridors are just jammed. Uh, it's it's not a six-foot distancing operation at all, <clears throat> and a lot of our stuff is large gathering pieces, everything from assemblies to uh, we also have the concept of graduation ceremonies. So we're we're just assuming that, you know, we may even have to make some huge adjustments in the fall uh, because we are not going to be able to without some level of, of, uh, of absolute uh, a, 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 a testing situation that we can 
we can we can just operate as normal. Now that said, in the short run, you know we're continuing to to, to, to kind of get this remote learning piece under our belt. Some people had to make huge adjustments on the, especially parents had to make huge adjustments. Kids have had to make huge adjustments. We had the technology and a, and a pretty good technology department, but it's not that that technology was used by everyone on a daily basis, and, and now it is. So that, that, that's been a little bit of a strain on the system. But I finally feel today that, uh, that we're, we're starting to find a rhythm with that. Uh, we're meeting with you know, uh, teachers in each building by pod, you know, we, the elementary, uh, m- middle, and high school. Uh, every every week, and we're kind of getting that feedback from them. And I think they're starting to find a rhythm. The kids are. We do have some kids though that are falling through the cracks, and we're, we're going to continue to figure out ways to to deal with with those kids because you can you can you can certainly guess that if you have students who were not engaged in the learning uh, when you were in the building, it doesn't change a lot when you're outside the building. As a matter of fact, it might even get a little bit worse. But that's why we haven't. Uh, much like Joe, we haven't laid off anybody, so all of our uh, behavior interventionists, all of our counselors, all of our nurses, uh, all of our um, uh, behavior uh, specialists have all stayed engaged because we're just using those people uh, to really track down uh, kids who just don't seem connected or, or, or invested. And, uh, and it's working to a certain degree. I mean, it, it, it depends on the age. At the elementary level, you know, I, I'm being told that, you know, we've got 90 to 95 percent of our kids who are engaging and on, on almost a daily basis, certainly on a weekly basis. Middle school, it drops to about 75 percent, and and then at the high school level, it can it can get as low as 50 percent, and that's a that's a challenge because you know these kids are older and 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 it, it's just hard. They they you know kids. Just in general, will when left to their own devices, will sleep in until noon time, you know, and it's it's just hard to, to to mitigate that and to work with that. But I but I feel like the parents are being incredibly cooperative, uh, and our support service system is is in place. So I think that that's good. And we are now uh, in a different we're in what's called the continuity of learning phase of this. So we are assessing work. We are looking at performance standards. We do want to not only mitigate against regression, but we want to have kids move forward a little bit. But we understand that if I'm teaching Algebra 1 this year in this environment, that Algebra 2 might look a little different next year because kids in this environment can't get exactly what they would get with five days a week of 45 minutes of instruction. So it's, it's, it's just been a constant balance uh, and challenge uh, moving forward. Uh, and then the only other thing, we, we did centralize that lunch program. I think I talked about that the last time. We're on the phone, so all of our lunches are now being prepared out of the Windsor School. We'll close down all the other buildings uh, for, uh, for both, uh, you know, safety sake and, and, uh, and also it, it's, it's saving us a little bit of money, too. But it was mostly around what our insurance company and OSHA were telling us about the less buildings you have open, the better off you are. So... Uh, hats off to Windsor and the Windsor folks. Uh, those buses from Heartland and Wethersfield and Albert Bridge in West Windsor pull into that school in the morning and they pick up those breakfasts and lunches. And uh, Craig Lacarno, who's our food service director, and Jim Taft, our, our maintenance director, and Wendy Moody, who's organizing that whole operation, hats off to them because they're right now they're serving somewhere between seven and 800 uh, kids a day, and I think that's only going to climb. Uh, and uh, and they're serving them now since we centralized it. It's our own self-operation system. So the, the vendor that we used for a long time at Windsor is now finished, uh, and uh, they did a good job, but they couldn't keep up with this pace or the quality with this pace. So um, you know, so now you know now kids are they're getting chicken breast and spaghetti and meatballs and you know real really hearty lunches that are microwavable in microwavable containers and. A good breakfast, so I, I'm just proud of all of all of that work. Um, other than that, it's also the financial stress, and I'll end there. And that's why I asked Tom those questions because uh, we're getting very bad news, uh, much like Tom is at the local level. We're getting that at, at the school level and at the state level because the Ed Fund, which basically all of our towns receive money from the Ed Fund. Uh, that Ed Fund is in trouble, and they're estimating it could be anywhere from a 
hundred million to two hundred million dollar shortfall next year because that ed fund is fed by the lottery. You know, people aren't buying a lot of lottery tickets these days. Uh, it, it's fed by sa- uh, sales tax, uh, rooms and meals taxes, uh, employment taxes, and uh, you know you can just tell that those those revenue numbers are not there. So we're being told to hang on tight, brace, and I'm sort of with Tom is. Uh, I'm, we're just going to hope and pray that somehow, either at the federal level or state level, but it's all our money, right, that that there's going to be some way to mitigate this and deal with this because uh, I just don't know how what we would do if all of a sudden our Ed Fund revenue uh, was was cut in half. I mean, it would it would decimate the system at this point. So I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. And also, then there's the other side of that, which are the property taxes. Uh, like Tom said, he has no idea what that's going to look like in September when he goes out for that first collection. Uh, and that's the other two-thirds of our school budget. So it's just it's it, it kind of what keeps superintendents up at night, I think, and we'll see what happens. It's not going to just be the schools, but the schools rely heavily on people being gainfully employed. <laughs> and, it, you know, and, and, and if they're not, then it just impacts all the way down the line. So... Um, we just going to hang on tight and just pray that it all works out, and uh, we'll see what happens. But that's the, that's the truth of where we are right now. We are holding back on expenses. We're not, you know, we're being careful about, you know, who and when we hire. Uh, we're saving some money this year on, you know, like we're not hiring substitute teachers. You know, we're not heating the buildings right now. Um, we're, uh, you know, we have been able to, to, to deal with, with some of those things. So I think we're going to end up, okay at the end of this year but going into next year it really does worry me a little bit i think that's it on my side unless anybody has questions hey dave uh one of the things we're working on where uh we have a, a number of different efforts in place about expanding broadband access in town it's not something that we're going to see like within a year but we're setting the table for some programs that are out there do, do you folks have records of Windsor families that don't have access to high-speed Internet that are needing to find a different uh, thing for remote learning? Yeah, we, we, I, I'm sure that that list is somewhere um, because I, that's what we did during that maintenance period is we just we tried to find out, okay, who really doesn't, doesn't have it. And uh, so I know there's a list. There and and if you're talking about Windsor proper or Windsor essentially, and I don't know if that would include West Windsor, but certainly in in in, in the Mount Scutney school district, um, yeah, I think we could easily let you know where we would need additional hotspots, and Larry would probably be the best contact on that. Uh, I know they've been in touch with him when he's had to r- run out and try to get somebody some level of internet, but yeah. yeah. But, we, we can we can come up with that somehow. Larry can for sure. All right. Well, we're, we're we'll be working with Comcast. Well, what we're trying to do is take the anecdotal uh, evidence of who has service and who doesn't, and the more concrete profile we have, uh, expecting that some part of the stimulus package is going to be broadband expansion. Uh, hopefully, we'll be closer to the front of the queue if we can go in with hard data saying this is the number of customers, this is where we are. So we don't necessarily need to know the names of people who don't have service, just more like what roads they may be uh, on, and we'll match that up with information we can get from Comcast on where their cables run and stuff like that. So I'll get with Larry, and uh, and then the community can just know that that's uh, – we know that there are people who have access to nothing, and then there are people who have access to substandard speed that don't really allow them to work online. Uh, I think I mentioned the last time that uh, the library, the town hall, and the school all have Wi-Fi that's uh, fast enough to accommodate things like video conferencing. But uh, we are working hard on, on how we can expand the footprint in town. Yeah, no, that, that's good. And I'll tell you, wins is probably, I mean, this may not be helpful for our for our uh, drawing heavily from the stimulus package, but wins is probably in, in reasonably good shape compared to other areas, I and mean, especially around town, around the schools. That's good. But I, I think as you get out into those deeper areas, and that's where that's where Larry could be helpful, because I know he's made a few he's made a few house calls, and he could 
he could probably tell you, yeah, this neighborhood's not good, or these two streets are lousy. You know, so that yep. that, that could be helpful. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to start mine off with some positive notes. Uh, and some figures that kind of will feed off of what Joe said earlier. Um, uh, the first and foremost number I want to give you is the fact that for the first time in a 24-hour period since the start of uh, keeping track of coronavirus deaths, Vermont had zero um, as of this morning. Um, so we went a 24-hour period with zero deaths from coronavirus, which is a great thing um and we only went up in five positive cases throughout the state yesterday even though we tested 352 people yesterday um windsor county has always been in pretty good shape and i'm talking about windsor county here uh to date we've only had 38 positive cases for covid and which figures out to about 6.87 people per 10,000 within our county. Um, and those are numbers I, I like to report on because we've been hearing a lot of negative. Um, some of the other important things that are coming out of the State Emergency Operations Center is uh, starting this week, um, actually started yesterday, uh, they're doing food banks, uh, they're going to be doing points of distribution uh, different airports throughout the state, uh, Friday, April 24th, at the Rutland Southern Regional Airport. They'll be giving food there uh, for our area Monday the 27th uh, at Hartness State Airport uh, down on the Weathersfield-Springfield line. So if there are people in our area that, that are needing meals, so on and so forth, um, and they can get boxes, a uh, seven-day supply of MREs, uh, meals ready to eat for each member of their household. Once again, that's Monday, April 27th at the airport down in Weathersfield. Um, uh, on, as we all know, on the 17th, Governor Scott announced another addendum to reopening businesses here in the state of Vermont uh, and mandatory health and safety guidance that will require all these businesses to follow. Um, things like if you're sick, you don't come to work, uh, employees must observe strict social distancing of six feet while in the job. Uh, they have to wear non-medical cloth face coverings over nose and mouth when in the presence of others while they're on the job. They don't have to wear it all the time, but if they come within six feet of somebody, they've got to put those on. Uh, they have to have easy access to things to sterilize their hands, clean their hands while they're working, uh, frequent uh, disinfecting, cleaning, so on and so forth, the uh, things they're working with. And this is going to be a tough one for a lot of places, is that no more than two people shall occupy any vehicle when conducting on their way to work or coming home from work. Um, and... You know, some of those businesses that were phased in that we spoke about earlier are outdoor businesses and construction operations, retail operations, but the all orders have to occur over the phone. There will be no in-store transactions allowed at this time. Um, low contact or no contact professional services, we heard about, you know, the town clerk upstairs starting to do that, but things like appraisers, realtors, um, attorneys, property managers, pet care operators, they're all allowed to go to work. This is an important one, I think, going to make a lot of people happy. Farmers markets will be allowed to reopen May 1st. They're, they're coming up with guidelines as to how they're going to do that, and I'll get more information out when I receive that. So that'll be, once again, on May 1st, we can start looking for some fresh stuff from the farmers markets. Um, if you'd like, I can talk about some of the federal funding that's available out there. Um, or if people want to get in touch with me, please call the firehouse, and I can direct them in the right direction uh, for pay tax protection program, economic injury disaster loans, uh, and these are for private and businesses, uh, consumer resource loans. I've got all kinds of information on that. 
Uh, let's see. The Department of Labor is going to launch a new application portal for self-employed workers and independent contractors to claim unemployment benefits. Um, if anybody out there listening or to this hears that, please feel free to call the firehouse and ask for me, and I'll I'll get you that information. And let's see, we'll totally shift away from that kind of stuff. Um, some of the problems we are seeing on the emergency emergency management side is people are trying to clean things and they're getting creative in the way they're sterilizing things. Um, people have to follow directions on the labels. They're mixing chemicals that shouldn't be mixed um, and getting injured or making themselves sick. Uh, and they should always be wearing gloves when using this stuff or, or mixing things and use them in well-ventilated areas. And, of course, as always, please keep it out of the reach of, of kids. Uh, and a couple of last things I want to talk about are the percentages of people. And um, the interesting thing is the median age for people infected with COVID-19 uh, is 55 years of age. And the distribution of Vermont COVID-19 deaths by age group, under 65, there were only five deaths. 66 to 75, there were 10. The, the largest percentage uh, with 17 fatalities was between 76 and 85. Um, and then over 85, there were eight. And then when it comes to men and women, um, males represented 65% of the deaths at 26, and women 35 with 14. And that's all about I want to report on. I can report uh, a little on the fire, Windsor Fire Department side as well. I have had, you know, to uh, cut uh, one shift a day because obviously um, statewide, uh, region-wide, um, calls are down. We're not getting, you know, a lot of the calls we normally get because um, people aren't out driving. They're not crashing. Um, they're not doing things that they normally would be doing, so we're not bringing in the revenue. Um, so I had to make the hard decision to tell my part-timers um, I've got to get rid of this one shift. And, you know, hopefully when things start picking up and the elective surgery start happening again, I can get them all back to work. Um, we are um, transporting patients from one hospital to the next that are COVID positive, positive. I have had to uh, quarantine a couple of our employees. Uh, luckily, the patients turned out um, not to be COVID positive. Um, as Tom said earlier, we are taking all protective measures to protect our folks here um, in the work that we're doing. Uh, we're treating every patient as if they're COVID positive, um, but when we know they are, we even go that much higher. Um, and, of course, it takes our ambulance out of service uh, while we're doing the decontamination process. So, you know, we're trying to keep ourselves as mentally healthy as possible, but it, it's starting to wear thin on us with this added stress of not knowing what's happening. So thank you for uh, businesses out there that have been supporting us and backing us uh, we greatly appreciate it and say thank you. And that's all I 